Let's all stand as we go back into the Word. I'm sorry, I told you to sit. Let's turn our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 37. Familiar, familiar word. And we're going to stop over in the book of Isaiah this morning and see what the Spirit of God is going to say to us. Amen. Let me see. See who wants to hear what God has to say. Yeah, that's why we're in this house this morning. We can hear what God has to say to us. Amen. Isaiah 37 verse 1 and we'll see that Jerusalem finds themselves in a predicament. Somebody say predicament. And when you hear the word predicament, it doesn't always sound good. Right? You hardly hear people say I'm in a good predicament. When you hear the word predicament, it speaks of trouble. It speaks of chaos. It speaks of fear. It speaks of calamity. Right? So they find themselves in a predicament. But Jerusalem was the house of God and still is the house of God and were the people of God and still belongs to the Lord. Amen? Because one day we're going to march into the new Jerusalem. Amen? Praise God. So God's got a city to come down at some point. But here, Jerusalem find themselves in trouble. Let's read. Isaiah 37 verse 1, and so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, mm, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he, then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shibna described, the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet. The son of Amos. And they said to him, thus said Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. Oh my God. That, that, that's not, that doesn't sound like fun. That doesn't sound like anything to gloat over and get excited. That doesn't sound like anything to rejoice about. This is a day of trouble, rebuke, and blasphemy. For the children, look at this. Look, look what's happening here. For the children have come to birth. But there is no strength to bring forth. You know, as I read this scripture, I, I pictured a woman, you're pregnant for nine months. You're pregnant for nine months and you're excited about your baby. And when it's time to give birth, there is no strength. You know what that says? Baby gonna die. Because baby had enough time being in the womb. Baby needs to come out. But water is broken and everything. But there is no deliverance. Baby's gonna die. That's a whole lot of message all by itself. But there is no strength to bring forth. So we are in trouble. The whole nation is about to die. That's what that's saying there. The whole nation is about to perish. We are ready to give birth. But there is no strength. Mighty God. Let's go forward. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of Rabashekha, whom Rabshekha, whom his master, the king of Assyria, sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayers. You see that? Lift up your prayers for the remnant that is left. So the servants of the king of Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord. There is no time like now that we need to hear the Lord's voice. We're just coming out of a pandemic and it looks like we're going right back in again. No time than this. We need to hear the voice of God more than any other time. To fear not, to be strong. Haven't I made you strong, church? 
Haven't I taught you how to pray? Thus saith the Lord. Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard. With which the servants, the king of Assyria, blasphemy. Surely I will send a spirit upon him. And he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own land. Let us pray. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise, honor, and thanks that you're God, you're in control. We pray, God, that you'll take this word and stir our hearts, stir our minds, stir our spirits. I pray this word will go forth, God, and it will change our lives. That, God, we will not be the same when we have left this place. We will not be the same in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Holy Ghost, we are depending on you to be the voice of this word in the name of Jesus. Bring Breathe upon your church this morning. Breathe upon your people. Lord God, just like Israel, Jerusalem was in trouble, God, many of us are in trouble. And I pray, God, that your word will bring deliverance. We, your servants, we stand before you this morning and we ask you to advocate on our behalf. We ask you to intervene on our behalf. We ask you to fight the battles for us in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you the glory, the honor, the praise, and the thanks for what you have done and what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we see a situation, you may be seated, we see a situation where the king of Assyria has sent his messenger and his messenger, Rabshakeh, is just there talking to Israel and to, to Jerusalem rather. Because at this point, they had already captured Judea. The king of Assyria and the army of Assyria was a very strong army. It was an army not to reckon and not to mess with. They were an army that would defeat anyone that came up against them or anyone that they go up against. They would conquer those nations. So here now, they were getting ready to come for Jerusalem. Because they got Judea, the other part, the other kingdom. Now they were coming for the next kingdom. At this point, we know Israel is divided. Israel, we always pray for Israel. And in parts of history, they are not one nation. They are divided people. One side was here fearfully and wonderfully serving God, but the other side did not even care. And the Bible says, if we forget God, the enemy will come in and the enemy will run rampage over us. If we forget to pray, if we forget to worship, if we forget to praise, guess what? God says enough is enough. You want trouble? Take trouble. You want to forget me? Take what the devil got for you. And sometimes we treat God like a little puppet. We pick him up when we want him but when all things are good and comfortable we're not praying we're not praising we're not worshiping we're not crying before God we're not weeping before the altar and the porch we're not holding on the spiritual horns of the altar and saying God have mercy on our land God have mercy on the generation God have mercy on our politicians God have mercy on our children God have mercy on our young young and old no Oh, we're just going with the flow and Judea went with the flow and there were no more they were taken captive but here now he came to Jerusalem and Hezekiah came from a wicked lineage his father was a wicked king his father was Ahaz and whoever told you you got to be like your parents Whoever told you, you got to be like your past. Whoever told you, you cannot be what God wants you to be. That's one of the wiles of the enemy. 
that's one of the tricks of Satan uh, that comes and lies to you and when you want to push forward with God uh, he comes and reminds you of your past uh, and he brings to memory where you came from uh, but mighty God uh, I read the word uh, and the word said that God uh, he forgot about my sins uh, I read the word uh, and he said I roll your sin uh, in a sea of forgetfulness uh, I read the word uh, and it says uh, I will press forward uh, to the mark of the high calling uh, I read the word uh, and greater is he that is in me I've read the word and I've been washed with the blood I've read the word and I am the righteousness of God but here Hezekiah was a man that feared God after his fathers and grandfather they tore down the altars of the Lord because when David was king after Saul died, David came and reinstituted everything that was necessary for the presence of God to come down among his people. He set up the altars of worship. He set up the musicians. Uh, he put them to worship 24 hours. So the next time you come to church uh, and it goes beyond two hours, shut up and be quiet. The next time you come to church and you said, oh, they're praying too long. You better be quiet. Because we're about to hit a season where we might go for four hours uh, and it might be normal because we want to see change. Uh, we want to see transformation. We want to see the glory of God. Uh, we want to see God move in our generation. Uh, it is time for us to get back uh, to what church was like. Uh, it's time for us to come back uh, to be the church uh, and not try to look cute uh, and not try to fit in. Let me tell you, well, I got news for you this morning. Uh, we're not fitting in we're gonna set trends we're not fitting in we're gonna show the way we're not fitting in we're gonna turn over some tables we're not fitting in we're gonna bruise our knees we're not fitting in no you see what the devil did to the church for the last 20 years he deceived the leaders of the church and he deceived the shepherds that set the standard for the church. Where we want to fit in. Where we temper down church to accommodate the world. We temper down the church to fit the culture. We temper down the church thinking the young people are going to come. But the more we got cool and try to look like them, they ran. They ran. So we thought we were bringing a generation, but we lost the generation. We thought we were facilitating a generation, but we lost them. Because we're busy trying to accommodate. So Israel had wicked kings. And in the mindset of accommodating, they broke down the altars of the Lord. Because they wanted to accommodate the strangers. They wanted them to come in and feel comfortable among them. Whoever told you when you come into the church you must feel comfortable? Because the word of God is a sword. It's going to cut you. It's going to pierce you. It's going to choke you where you don't want to be choked. It's going to mash you up. It's going to mess with your ego. It's going to mess with your facade. It's, and unless your facade gets breaking, God can't get to your heart. This is nowhere to be comfortable. This is a place that you come to hear where you're going wrong. Woo! This is a place where you come to hear you're not living right. This is a place that you come to know how you must live. That's what the church is. This is the best hospital. You got emotional sickness, you come here, you find healing. You have mental issues, you come, your mind gets straight. Why is it we leave all the people that are mentally ill to go to psychiatry where they can't get no word, where they can't get no laying of hands, where they can't get nobody to hold them and call their minds back and say, come back in the name of Jesus. Come back. We got to change this thing. We got to shift. The way we're paddling church. Why 
why you think we're fasting? The moment that Hezekiah sensed trouble, he went and he put on, he tore his good clothes that he was wearing. And if you know anything about a king, he don't wear no cheap clothes. So it was, the trouble was so great. The man tore his clothes. And we're buying little cheap clothes. And when we come to church, we don't want to kneel on because, oh, my pants going to get messed up. Oh, my nice dress. And oh, my knees are going to get dark because when I wear my short skirt and short pants in summertime, my knees got to look good. Get some bleaching cream. Go home, bleach the thing out. Yeah. We got to kneel. Come in the church and kneel down. And when somebody is praying, get on your knees and say, yes, God, let it be, God. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Mighty God. The man tore his clothes. Why he tore his clothes? Because this man, who knew nothing of who God was, the servant of the king, one of the generals in his army, he sent him and he was blaspheming God because look what, the, what Hezekiah said. This is a time of trouble. We're in trouble because there's an army lined up. There's an army. Listen, the battle is real. The Bible said we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, rulers. We're in a more dangerous war now than they were in. Because they could have seen the enemy. Today we can't see the enemy. If we think that they were in trouble and the church, we get so caught up. That's why I always encourage faith church. It is time for us to live life with our eyes closed. Because Fanny Crosby, some of the great hymns that we sing, she was a blind woman. And they said to her, they said, Fanny, if you should live again in another lifetime, would you like to see with your eyes? She said, no, 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 no. She said, with my eyes being blind, I see even clearer. I see the mysteries of God. I experience God in a more personal way because I'm not distracted we gotta live with our eyes closed stop thinking of what you're short of stop worrying about the money you don't have and begin praying because the promises my God shall supply all your needs pray and don't worry pray and don't worry pray and don't worry pray because the moment they got in trouble they went to the house of God the moment they were in trouble they went to the house of God because they know the facility that is set up it housed the presence of God so they wanted to be near to God and they wanted to and now God is not we know God is omnipotent he's omnipresent he cannot be contained. He's so great. He's so big. But the house of God represents. It represents the presence of God. That it's a place you can connect with God. Why do we spend all of this and we set up a place? It's so that we can, people can enter in. You know? There's a space that they can enter in and come in and find reverence. Because when you're walking around, so you're not reverencing nothing. You just live in life. But when you come into this space, there's a different aura that takes you over. The atmosphere is different. So that's why he ran to the house of God because he wanted to feel that comfort. Even though he was in trouble. Being in the house of God did something for him. That is why we come to church, people of God. Don't let nobody tell you. And all these things we got to debunk. Where people say, I don't have to go to church. We got to cut that out. We got to stop agreeing. We got to stop saying, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, sometimes we agree with things that are wrong. People say, I don't have to go to church. You're like, yeah, it's true. No, it's a lie. You better find yourself in church. You better get yourself a church. Because this is where you get spiritual bread. This is where the presence of God comes down. This is where people are crying. This is where people are oh, pleading with God. Move. Change. Let things happen. Because where two or three are gathered in my name, that is where I am. 
And when the twos and the three get desperate, and you begin not to regard the things of this world, God will answer. God will answer. And we saw God answer because when they realize that this is a time of sword, they're in trouble. This is a time of rebuke where the man is standing there and he's telling them how powerless they are. You got to go back and read chapter 36. Read 36. Read from verse 1. Read all the way to 13. And he stood, verse 13 he said, he stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew. Now this man that the king sent could have spoken Hebrew. He's the enemy, but he knew their language. He's the enemy. He knows the language. There are people that are outside. They know the language of the church. They know how the church should sound. They know what the church should be doing. But yet those same people meet you up and discourage you from doing what the church is supposed to do. And we agree with them. You understand, child? We're in warfare. But now, we have to be so discerning that when they open their mouths and the devil is using them, it's not them because we're warning against that spirit. It's a spirit that we fight. We don't fight flesh and blood. We don't fight people. We fight the principalities. We fight the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. We fight principalities, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. We're going for them today. So he came and he was talking loud. And at one point, the, 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 the scribe said to him, like, Please don't speak in Hebrew. Speak in Aramaic. But he refused. You know why? He wanted to instill fear into the masses. Everyone understood Hebrew. So when he spoke in Hebrew, everyone, because he came on, he was speaking loud. So he was just there. Just imagine him. And he's saying, oh, Hezekiah, do not fool the people that God will defend them. Do not listen to your king because look at the nations that we have conquered. Look what has been done. Look at your brother Judea. We took them out like nothing. So he's there trying to instill fear. And that's what the enemy does. He comes in and he makes all this noise. He touches your health. Touches your finances. And he's speaking loud. He said, oh, you thought you were strong, but look at you now. He touches your family. He used even the people in your house to fight against you. He used your children through all sorts of influence. Because you're sending them to school innocently, but then they're coming home with different type of stuff, different type of behavior. People are doing things to them. The devil has all his agents set up to fight against us in so many ways. But I want to tell you, it is time we get mad. It is time that we get praised. It is time that we get strong. And when the devil come in like a flood, come on the standard. Come on the standard. Come on the standard. And say, not in my house, devil. Not in my family, devil. Not in my body, devil. Not in my church, devil. Take it somewhere else. Take it somewhere else. We got to be strong. The Bible said, they that know their God shall be. And if the word of God says that, what am I going to do? Be weak? That's one of the wiles of the devil. Tell you to be quiet. You pray quietly, brother. You pray about everything else. Say it loud. But when it comes time to prayer, you just pray under your breath. The Lord hears you. The Bible said, worship God with a shout. He said, worship him on the cymbals. Get the string instrument. Worship him with a dance. Listen, it's not time when you come in church to look and listen to the choir. You get involved with the worship. You get involved with the dance. Don't look at the dance group to entertain you. We got to bring our dance. We got to bring our dance. So he was here. And he was defiling um, Israel. And look what he said. Let's go. Let's look at it from scripture here. And it says, do not, verse chapter 37, verse 10. 
Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you. You see that there? Saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the king of Assyria have done to all, to the lands, utterly destroying them. And shall you be delivered? God told them, Isaiah the prophet brought the word, he said, God is going to deliver you. I will cause the king of Assyria to fall by a sword in his own land. After God has given you his word, the devil then comes and tries to counter attack the word of God. He wants to come now and instill his words. His words. Because the moment he gets us to fear and back down. You see, servants as servants of God. We have a defender. We have a God that fights our battles. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, we got to remember that God has standards that he can raise. And sometimes God will fight by fire. Sometimes he's going to fight by flood. He got hailstone he could use sometimes. There's different levels. And there's sometimes he's going to just speak the word. But remember this, we have a defense system. So as you're trusting God and you're serving God and you're living for the Lord, know that they that put their trust in the Lord shall never be put to shame. They shall be like Mount Zion. They shall not be moved. We got to have this confidence because when the enemy comes in, we got to run to the word just like Jesus. He said, listen, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. We got to live on this thing. We got to live on this word. It is time for us to read our Bibles. Because why we're defeated, we don't know what God says about us. We live in defeated lives. And then you're just like, oh, I didn't know God said that about me. You got to read the will. There's a will for your life. You want to know what you got to do? Read the word of God. Yeah. In season and out of season. Teach it to your children. It is your job to teach your children the word of God. Stop hoping for the church to do it. Take some responsibility. Take some responsibility, parents. Take some responsibility, grandparents. Teach your kids. You teach them everything. You make sure they do their homework. But when last you said, what did you read today in your Bible? No wonder our kids are using drugs left, right, and center. No wonder our children are taking off their clothes left, right, and center. And they think it's okay. No wonder because we didn't do our job. The Bible said there was a generation in Israel after Joshua that did not know God. Right after they got the deliverance. They were just basking. We came to America and we're living in the good land now. So we ain't got time with God. All we're worrying about is Benjamins. When we were back home, we went to church all the time. All the time. And you know what we say? Oh, because those people are not busy. No. You had a zeal for God. You had a passion for God. You got saved and you were running zealously after the Lord. Where did it go? The zeal is not in the land. The zeal should be in the man. You understand that? The zeal should be in the man. It doesn't matter what system the world sets up to get us caught up with money and, and with vanity and with cars and with house. And some people feel that if they don't drive a certain car, they're nobody. That's a lie from the devil because the devil got you trapped right there. All you're thinking about is what you're driving and how it looks. The car can't do nothing for nobody. You could buy it for 100,000, 300,000, or 10,000, or 5,000, or 200. It all does the same thing. But if it's parked, it can't do nothing for It's the man that drives a car or the woman that drives a car that could set the captive free, that could liberate you from the darkness. It is you, church. We got to know God for ourselves. We got to humble ourselves before God's servants are humble people. The moment Hezekiah recognized that he was in trouble, he humbled himself before the Lord. Some of us are in, in so much trouble, but we can't come to the place and say, you know what? God, I need your help. 
Sometimes we're too puffed up for even God. Because we're wondering if God will hear us. That's pride. Humility would receive what God says. He said, I, my ears are not too heavy. Hey, there's subtle pride, you know. There's subtle pride. Subtle pride. Where you now are worried about your works instead of what Christ has done. You're caught up in you. Subtle, the devil has so much deception that is traveling across this world. Where it's, I was speaking to a young man and he said, you know what? He don't want to talk to God only when he needs stuff. He don't want to seem like he's calling on God only when he needs stuff. But what God says, he makes the rain fall on the just and on the unjust. It is his will and none should perish but all should come to repentance. God's ear is open to the cry. He's open to the cry of his children. We got to know when we're in trouble what to do. Get into the presence of God. Get there. Humble ourselves. Because God has a defense for us. God has a way of fighting our battles. You know what I love about David so much? Uh, when they were ridiculing uh, the army of Israel, when Goliath came out, uh, David wasn't so worried that they were cussing his brothers that was in the army. He said, who are these uncircumcised Philistines uh, that will come to defile the armies of the living God? Amen. We got to be so, have such understanding that when the enemy comes in, he's not only fighting against particular people, but he's fighting against God. When the people were fighting against Moses, God took it personal. God said, listen, um, Moses, they're not fighting you. You know they're fighting? They're fighting me. Because it's my will to deliver them. It wasn't your will. I sent you down to Egypt. You were taking care of your father's sheep, but I sent you down Egypt to deliver them. But now they're fighting against their own deliverance. So we got to look, you know, when all these things are happening in our world, in our country, in the church, we got to know that it's not against individuals, but it's against God. Because the enemy's goal is to stop what God is doing. You think the enemy was happy that Hezekiah had set back up the altars of worship? He had brought back the glory into the house of God? He had brought the people back into the presence of God? No! So watch out when you begin praying, when you begin to get serious about the things of God, watch out for the devil. He's going to send his people to, uh, and use people because he don't send spirits as much as he sends people. The spirits we don't see, they work in the background. They're, they're putting deposits and putting deposits in the mind of man and in the mind of people. And then people carry them out. But we got to know what God has promised us. God, the, the word of God says here, do not be afraid. Verse, verse 5. So the servant of Hezekiah came to Isaiah and Isaiah said to them, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid of the words which you hear. It's a saying that if you speak a lie over and over, it becomes truth. Speak a lie over and over, it becomes truth. Be careful of what it is you're listening to. Be careful where it is you're putting your ears. Be careful of the voices that you are entertaining. Be mindful of the people you're hanging out with. Because we become desensitized after a period of time. We become desensitized. Little by little, as we were saying, it doesn't go black, it goes gray first. So be careful. So the prophet said to them, do not be afraid of the words that you hear. Because he said to the prophet, it is a time of trouble. He was feeling it in his spirit. It was a time of trouble but he, the prophet now says to him you're doing the right thing you're in the presence of God you're crying out before God God will hear and God will answer and not only answer God defends his own church as you serve in the kingdom of God you're not alone as you lay your life down for the cause of God God will not let you suffer with the wicked Look at verse, verse 12. Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my father have destroyed? 
Gozan, Hiram, Rephaz, the people of Eden were in Telassar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpa, the king of the city of Sepharim, Hena, Ivar? So he was listing out some names of the, the cities that they had taken. He said, where is their God? They were all crying to their God. But what he did not realize, the God that he was talking about, the God of Hezekiah, was the God that gave him the privilege of breathing. It was the God that gave him the privilege to open his mouth and speak. And he didn't know that you, God gives every man a long rope. God is full of grace and full of mercy. But the moment you cross the line, God's got you. The moment you come up against uh, the people of God and you touch God's anointed, God has a way to deal with you. Jerusalem was God's anointed people. And God was not going to let them perish with the wicked. And I want Faith Church to hold this today and those that are watching online. God will not allow you to perish with the wicked. If we stand firm, we put our heels in the ground and we do not let up and we do not give up. God has a way to let the enemy's own sword kill him. You don't even have to sometimes lift your hand. There are times God will tell you, go do this, go do that. But in this situation here, Israel didn't even have to lift a sword. You know why? They were in the right posture. They were on their knees. When we're on their knees, God gets all the glory. When we're on our knees, it shows that he is king. Because we bow to the king. And we're like, great king, this is where we are. And we need your help. <laughs> and I need you to intervene. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. We got to come back to the place. When we come before God, we're coming before him with honor, with adoration, understanding who it is we're talking to. We're not talking to any and every God. We're not talking to the God of our fourth parents. No, we're talking to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking to the God. God that rose Jesus from the dead. We're talking to the God that could clean any disease. We're talking to the God that could heal cancer. We're talking to the God that could break open prison doors in the middle of the night and set these people free. We're talking to the God that could raise Lazarus from the dead. And if you don't watch it, he might just raise your family member. We're talking to the God that rides on the chariots of fire. So watch your posture when you come before him. Make sure your hearts are in the right place. It says, surely for seven, I will send a spirit upon him. And he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own land. This was the sword that was going to destroy Jerusalem. This was the sword. He told the people of Israel, we're going to take all of you captive into our land. And we're going to come and we're going to set up your altars in your land. And we're going to put you to shame and we're going to carry you captive one by one. You got to read the rebuke. Go and read the rebuke that he was standing there shouting loud. But God has a day with the wicked. God has a day even for the devil. You know that, right? There's a day the devil will be bound in chains and he will not be able to deceive the people no more. There's a day that is coming. And God has a day for your deliverance. This is the word of God, but yet the rebukes continue. The Bible said, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall bring it to pass. Amen. Where is the patience, church? Amen. Where is the waiting? Hallelujah. They that wait on the Lord shall have renewed strength. Amen. Waiting on God is not time wasted. Hallelujah. Wait for your season. Wait for your promotion. Why are we rushing? 
Isn't God God enough? If he brought a word for it, if he used his prophets, if he speak a word to you when you're reading his word, is it not he that will bring it to pass? Wait on God. The Lord, the word of God says, wait, I say, wait on the Lord. But we said, I'm going to wait. But the moment things are not going the way you want, you're like, oh, I feel God is saying I need to make something happen. I need to make something happen. Because it's not happening fast enough. No. You got to wait on God. Wait for your seasons. Seasons are going to change. Everything, there's a time to bond, there's a time to grow, there's a time to feed on milk, then there's a time to eat big food. There's a time for everything. And then you get old and you don't want to eat that big food no more. There's a time. Enjoy every season. Wait, wait. God says, I will cause his sword to turn on him. And imagine Hezekiah goes like, God, but here they are rebuking us. Here they are taunting us again. Here they are telling us how they're going to beat us. But let me tell you, there is a day that is coming where the enemies will be dealt with. And when you get the word of God, what we need to do is take the promises, put a praise on the promise. Put a praise on that promise. Servants of God, when you get a promise, praise God that he will bring it to pass. Glorify him that he is God. That his word shall remain. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But the word of God will last. And it is able to endure any blasphemy. It's able to endure any reproach. It's able to endure any storm. It's able to endure any thief breaking in or breaking out. Once God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 36, let's skip over. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed the camp of the Assyrians. 185,000 people. Didn't God say he would do it? Didn't God say do not be afraid? Our God is a God of war, you know. God doesn't give grace to the devil, you know. God does not give grace to his devil, to the devil. He doesn't give grace to demons. He gives grace to man. And if you want to tie up with devils, you're going to get what devils get. If you refuse to heed the instructions of God, when the demons are going to get their whooping by the angels of God, you're going to get the whooping with them. Because you refuse to let go. What did, what did Moses say to them? Those who are on the side of the Lord come this side. Lemon Shaba. Yan Loki. Kiraba. He said, Lo Rebo Sakariba Siando Robo Shata. I pray conviction will move in this house. Conviction move to this house like you never moved before. Holy Ghost move like you never moved before. In the name of Jesus. Moses was trying to warn him. He said, listen, you better step out from over there. If you're standing on this side and on the Lord's side, you better step over here. Because the earth is about to open. You might see the earth close right now. And it looks like mercy is falling. And grace is falling. But the moment you blink, the wrath of God will fall. Because he's a God of war. And he's also a God of grace. And he's also a God of mercy. That is just who he is. 
So the moment you think you're walking good uh, and everything is fine and dandy uh, and you can play church uh, and you can play it Christian, uh, you better watch out. Because there comes a time where God gets tired of the taunting. And God gets tired of people abusing his people and abusing his grace. And he says enough is enough. It is time for me to show you who is God. I'm going to show you who is God. We got to remember that God deals in our affairs. There's a God that deals in the affairs and he executes justice. What does God execute? Justice. When Solomon became king, he said, God, teach me the ways of justice. That I could do what is right. Justice represents what is right. What is right. So God said, you're taunting me, boys. You're not fighting against Hezekiah as much. You're not fighting against the children of Israel. I'm about to take this up to a new level. I'm going to get ready to come down because you will not relent. You will not give up. I've given you time. Change your ways. Change your mind. Step back. Come out from among them. Be separate. And I'll be a father unto you. And I'll be, but we don't want that. We want the whooping. Sometimes we don't want grace. Grace is too sweet. We want a little whooping to feel human. I think that's how we sometimes operate. The grace is so good and we abuse the grace and we abuse the mercies of God. And as you read through the word of God, God gets so tired in the days of Noah. He said, I regret I made man. Then we see how he extended mercy and grace. He sent Moses down to Israel. He brought these people out. God said, Moses, get out the way. Let me kill all of them. Moses said, no, God, you can't do that. These are your people. It's only because the blood was spilled and, and Jesus paid the price and covered sins. God don't see it, you know. God don't even see our sins because the blood of Jesus covers it. Or is it would have been fair game. It would have been fear gain. But we thank God for his grace. And, that, and we got to come back to a place to rejoice for the grace of God. Rejoice for the mercies of God. No scriptures that has it not been for the mercies of God will be long consumed. Be grateful, church. Be grateful. But God fights for his servants. He fights for his people. He don't leave us to, to, to the attacks and the, the wiles of the enemy because he has equipped us, a church. He has equipped us to fight this battle. Today we're in a better place than Hezekiah was. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. We have the Holy Ghost that is living, breathing, and working within us. And we look back here and God now caused the, the, the angel of the Lord to come down. And he defeated the army on their behalf. And look at this. And when the people rose early in the morning, they were the corpse all dead. 185,000 men laying dead on the floor. And Israel did not even lift a sword. Think of the power of your prayers now. You know that you can do this? You can command the angels of heaven to do this? To fight against the wicked spirits that are fighting against us? Yeah. But sometimes we get so twisted, we fight against each other and we forget that there are spirits and, and, and wickedness that we should be fighting against. And we sit and we worry about little trivial things uh, and we're not able to command anything because we're so caught up fighting among ourselves. You're fighting in your home, the devil got you fighting with your spouse, you can't even pray. He knows where to instill complexes within you. He knows your weak points and he troubles those areas more than anything. Sometimes you fight with your kids. And then when you're done fighting with your kids, you feel like a failure. You fight with your boss and then you leave and you're like, oh my God, but I'm a child of God. What kind of light I have? 
That's why you got to watch the wiles of the devil when they're coming in and say, no, you're not going to take me, devil. You're not going to take me with the little trivial things. It's not always the big thing. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. The little foxes, church. God wants to defend us. God wants to fight for us. But we got to have a posture of humility. God fights our battles. God defeats the devil. God defeats our enemies. Look what he did here. And if you read through, you'll see. Verse, 30, verse 37. So, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned to his home and remained in Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshipping in the house of Nishrach, his god, that his sons, who know, who's that? His sons, Aramalech and Sharazar, struck him down with the sword and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And his son became king. Verse 7 says, I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own land. If God gives us a word, stand on the word. And if the word of God says something like this, seek for us the kingdom of God, his righteousness and all things shall be added. Why are we not obeying that? Obeying those words. We're seeking every other thing. We're getting distracted. We're seeking every other thing. But not the kingdom of God. We're building every other thing, but we will not want to invest our lives. We want to invest our money. We want to invest our treasure. We don't want to invest our time, our talents into the things of God. But God said he will supply all our needs if we do that. He said, pray the kingdom of God come. But prayer meeting night, nobody's in prayer meeting. Thank God that's not the case here. But, you know, people show up to prayer in this house. But, but we can do better. We can do better. Every one of us has a responsibility to pray. Yeah. Hezekiah prayed. And not only him, the leaders got behind him. They went and kneeled long. They put on sackcloth. When it was time for them to go see the prophet, he sent them with sackcloth so he shows the posture of their hearts that they're in trouble. Church, it is time for us to turn. God is going to defend his servants. But there's certain things the servants have to do. We got to be humble. We got to stand in the word of God. If God says it, he's going to bring it to pass. Wait for the deliverance. Don't run ahead of God. Wait for the deliverance. Wait. Your time weeping endures for the night. But there's a morning that's going to break. It will not be night all the time. And in your waiting... Get your praise up. Get your praise up. Do not look cast down. Do not look like the, 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 the Pharisees that when they're praying, they don't shave their beards and they look miserable. No! Because you'll go through the fire and you'll come out. You won't even look like you went through the fire. You'll go through the floods and they shall not overtake you. You'll be like the Hebrew boys. A hair was not burnt. Their clothes was not burnt. They were not scorched. You'll go through the fire, but you will not look like it. Because God is walking side by side. The heads of the Lord are around the righteous. The eyes of the Lord are upon his children. And whatever word God's promise, he's God enough to perform it. Let's all stand.